Hello everyone, this is Dr. Alex Vasquez. I'd like to announce uh, an upcoming book that I anticipate will be ready for publication in early uh, 2013. Uh, this is going to be called Integrative Rheumatology, which has already been published in two previous editions. So this is basically uh, an expansion of that Integrative Rheumatology book. Uh, last year, as many of you know, I published another book called uh, Nutritional Immunology and Functional Immunomodulation. So I'm actually taking the information from that book, expanding it, integrating it into my integrative rheumatology book, and I'm going to try to publish this as one very, very large book. Uh, in fact, it'll probably be too big for the uh, publisher's uh, capacity, even though I work with uh, what I think is actually the largest publisher, um, one of the largest publishers in the world. Uh, for the type of formatting that I do with a soft cover book, uh, they have a limit of about 620 pages, and I'm expecting that this book will be at least 800 uh, or more pages, so I'll probably have to go to two volumes for this one. Uh, but as you can see here, the title of the book is going to be Integrative Rheumatology, Nutritional Immunology, and Functional Inflammology. Now, I didn't make up the term inflammology, even though I'm sure it's new to many people. Uh, it's actually been uh, in the peer-reviewed literature um, prior to my use of it, uh, but I do believe that I've coined the phrase functional inflammology, and the concept there, of course, is to view inflammatory diseases not as static entities, but actually as uh, dynamic states, which can therefore be influenced uh, by modifying the factors that contribute to and perpetuate those states. So that contrasts, for example, when we look at inflammatory disease from the perspective of pathology, if you look at a classic medical book like uh, Robin's Pathologic Basis of Disease, that's an example of a book that talks about uh, inflammatory disease from a very uh, pharmacocentric or very quote-unquote medical perspective. Uh, that is to say, uh, the inherent uh, con concept there is that inflammatory diseases are uh, permanent uh, rather than uh, functional and dynamic and therefore uh, amenable to intervention. So again, this will be published in early uh, 2013, 2013. I anticipate somewhere between 800 or, or more pages. Uh, and these are large pages as well. They're in the eight and a half by 11 size. So it's just a matter of cramming as much information as I can in there. Uh, and also allowing enough space due to larger page size for some graphics, uh, which you may have seen in my books before. Topics uh, will include uh, introduction to concepts, uh, patient assessment and musculoskeletal emergencies. Uh, that's a chapter of about 150 pages, 140 pages, uh, that I consider to be just basic background information. Uh, at least it's basic in background, but it's also the foundation upon which we can therefore move forward uh, with effective protocols. But we have to, of course, assess our patients accurately. So I provide some uh, listings of assessments, whether it's patient history or physical exam or laboratory assessments, uh, that then we can use to... Uh, create an integrated kind of uh, multi-dimensional uh, conceptualization of each individual patient uh, and from there we can obviously intervene more effectively. So for example, uh, one of the cases I talk about in the book uh, is this 50-year-old uh, man who had a diagnosis of so-called seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and as you can see here, his high sensitivity C-reactive protein uh, initially was 124 when I first saw him. This was back in 2005. Uh, and I got his, with the intervention that I detail in the book, I got his uh, CRP, his high sensitivity CRP, down from 124 to 7.5 within five weeks. So that's about a 98% reduction in C-reactive protein uh, in a patient with established inflammatory disease without the use of any anti-inflammatory drugs. So uh, I consider that and we consider that to be evidence that we were certainly on the right track. Remember, this is only five weeks into the treatment. So to get a 96, 98% reduction and a major inflammatory marker within that much time uh, was certainly impressive uh, for me at that time, but also uh, for the patient who was feeling better. Uh, he had been told that he would have this disease forever. Even though he had only had it for four years, he was, he was uh, told by his board-certified rheumatologist that once he had this disease, he would have it for the rest of his life. Uh, and he was told it was a genetic disease. Uh, again, we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis. And I, I told him, you know, I said, you've had the same genes your whole life, so why would you all of a sudden have a genetic, quote-unquote, genetic disease um, at 
you know, onset at age like 48 years old. Um, and he agreed with me that that didn't make any sense. So uh, we were able to intervene with uh, botanical medicines, diet, nutrition, supplements, a few lifestyle changes, and the use of a few uh, pharmaceutical drugs that were not anti-inflammatory drugs. So again, uh, he got impressive results uh, just with the overall integrative protocol, which I've now advanced, of course. Um, and we got his HSCRP down from 124 to 75. We were both pretty happy with that. Uh, a, another case that I'll review in the book, and you can see from the date on this one, this is just from uh, December of 2012. Uh, this is a patient that I'm working with who also has uh, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and she's been told that she has to take uh, biologic drugs and prednisone, methotrexate, sulfazalazine, plaquenil, etc. Uh, and so if reasonably, she's consulted uh, an alternative to that uh, medicalization of her disease. Well, one of the things that we found recently was that she's a uh, chronic carrier of chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, now called chlamydophila pneumoniae. And so that gives us yet another way that we can intervene in her case. Uh, so I go through the different lab tests. I go through some physical exam. We go through, of course, the specialty testing that I use uh, with my patients, such as uh, comprehensive parasitology. Uh, and you can see another case here. This was a man who had an autoimmune peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and as you can tell from the stool testing, he had Pseudomonas aeruginosa here. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces certain um, peptides that have molecular mimicry and therefore immune cross-reactivity with uh, neuronal tissues, such as myelin basic protein. So it was very fascinating to work with this case. This was about uh, 10 years ago uh, of this man who had had this chronic uh, inflammatory peripheral neuropathy. None of his neurologists could help him, even though... Uh, he had spent about $10,000 out of pocket on MRI, CT scans, lab tests, uh, lumbar puncture, uh, CSF analysis, uh, protein electrophoresis, like all of these tests, which were, you know, mostly reasonable, I presume. Um, and then after one month of working with the protocol that I prescribed for him, uh, his numbness and tingling was gone. Um, and it stayed gone for, I believe, about three or four years, and then he had a relapse. We, we implemented the protocol again, the infection, this dysbiotic infection had returned. Uh, so I treated that and the problem went away again. So really nice case. So again, you can see in this case, he's got good probiotics, uh, but he does have plus four pseudomonas. Uh, and again, that is a gram negative bacteria that shows molecular mimicry and immune cross reactivity with myelin basic protein. It's associated with the onset of multiple sclerosis. You can see also in his case, he's got uh, two dysbiotic yeast, Candida glabrata and Rotatorola as well. So uh, by the time we implemented some nutritional, dietary, lifestyle, and pharmacologic interventions, uh, we were able to uh, alleviate the numbness, tingling, and weakness that he had. He had had that for about uh, four years. We were able to alleviate that within about five weeks. And uh, it stayed gone for many years, as I already mentioned. And then when it came back, I reevaluated him using the same assessments, uh, including but not limited to stool analysis, and uh, we were able to clear the infection again. Chapter two discusses a naturopathic concept called uh, reestablishing the foundation for health, uh, which I also refer to as the promotion of wellness. So that's a chapter of, of about uh, 50, 60 pages, I believe, uh, that just discusses lifestyle interventions and kind of the scientific basis for those interventions. Uh, then I go into musculoskeletal care basics, uh, and then we get into pathogenesis and protocol components. So this is the chapter that's going to be updated from my previous publication of Integrative Rheumatology to discuss the new seven-part uh, functional inflammology protocol, as I now call it. Uh, the other thing that I want to say about uh, chapter one, uh, which I just added recently, is I've updated the information in there on risk management, documentation charting, informed consent, etc., so that uh, doctors will just have a quick review uh, of how to implement this protocol uh, completely and effectively and also in a way that helps them practice defensively. Uh, over the last year or so, I've started doing uh, malpractice litigation defense for doctors. And so uh, the experience I've had in reviewing doctors' charts is that often they're, they're missing some of the basics. And of course, that makes them much more vulnerable to uh, medical, legal, and financial liability. So I've taken some of my experience now working 
uh, as an expert witness in the legal field to uh, helping doctors avoid malpractice claims. So I just want to make sure that I uh, let everybody know that that's been updated into Chapter 1. So again, going back to Chapter 4 here, we talk about uh, disease pathogenesis and the associated components of the protocol uh, that address those components of pathogenesis. As you can see from the title of the book, a main theme here is deconstructing, deconstructing and deciphering this phenomena and enigma of inflammatory disorders. So rather than looking at inflammatory disorder, disorders uh, as phenomena that are difficult to understand, I try to help doctors and clinicians decipher those uh, conditions by breaking them down into their uh, components. And so that will be a massive undertaking to update that material for Chapter 4. Uh, again, I did publish it last year in the Nutritional Immunology and uh, Functional Immunomodulation textbook, but I'm going to try to go beyond that even and provide some more details, not only for clinical implementation, but also the understanding that we have on a molecular level for how this uh, whole process works. Uh, after that, I'll summarize my information on fibromyalgia, which was published in 2012 uh, in two separate books, the most recent of which was called uh, fibromyalgia in a nutshell. So I'll include that information here and then we'll get into the true inflammatory autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, scleroderma, and probably my favorite condition which is uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And the reason I like psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is because it's a unique condition that has obviously very clear dermatologic manifestations. And the benefit of that for patients and I think as clinicians is we can tell if we're on the right track or not uh, by the rapidity and the completeness with which those dermatologic lesions can be cleared uh, with the uh, integrative protocol. First example I had of, of the power of this protocol was actually back in around 2002 I believe so about 10 years ago when I was working with a young woman who was 18 years old and she had had psoriasis her entire life. Uh, her family and she reported that she had, had she had developed psoriasis when she was about six months of age and as I just said she had it every day of her life for 18 years and she was 18 years old when I saw her uh, and this was in a relative in a pretty hot climate in the southern part of the United States and despite the heat and humidity of that climate she had never worn shorts or sh shorts or uh, short sleeve shirt out in public because she was ashamed of this uh, skin rash that she had in the form of psoriasis uh, I remember the first time I saw her in my office, to me it looked as if she had had a third degree burn on most of her body. Her psoriasis was so bad, it was just unbelievable. So we implemented what I called at that point uh, step one or phase one of the protocol. And when she came back to see me a month later, her psoriasis was gone. And I remember, I remember the contrast in my statements. The first visit I saw her, I remember thinking to myself, wow, that looks like a third degree burn. And then when I saw her again, about four or five weeks later, after only implementing the first part of the protocol, her psoriasis was gone. And I distinctly remember telling her, I said, I said, I cannot diagnose you with psoriasis right now, even though a month prior she had the worst psoriasis I had ever seen. So because of that, psoriasis has just been a fascinating condition for me to work with clinically. I think the research on it is just amazing. And now with the advancement of science, uh, and you know biomedical research and translational research we have such a clear understanding of psoriasis that uh, you know I think for example to treat it with drugs uh, especially topical drugs I just think that that's uh, in, in my opinion pretty ridiculous uh, it's scientifically and we could argue ethically untenable to treat this as a skin condition yes the manifestations of psoriasis are on the skin but it's clearly a systemic problem that needs to be addressed as such. So after that we'll go into uh, Sjogren's syndrome, we'll go into the spondyloarthropathies and some of the uh, differential diagnoses there. We'll talk about sarcoidosis, uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, polymyalgia rheumatica, giant cell arteritis, temporal arteritis, Werner's granulomatosis, another very fascinating condition, uh, often fatal, uh, but also responds very well to, um, in this case, in this component of the protocol, uh, antimicrobial interventions. So I think that that gives us some very clear insight. In fact, um, I don't know how much more clarity we could want with Werner's granulomatosis. Uh, some of the uh, molecular pathogenesis, of course, has been defined now 
down to not only the molecules themselves, but actually the electrostatic charge that's on those molecules. So if we wanted a molecular understanding that really helps us, uh, again, kind of decipher the phenomenon of uh, vasculitic disease, then I think Werger's provides us that example. I talk about other vasculitic conditions, uh, and then a few other conditions that we see clinically uh, related to musculoskeletal pain, such as uh, hemochromatosis. Uh, following that, I will try to include a chapter on additional concepts and therapeutics, uh, and I'll also try to include some of my previously published articles. I've published about 100 articles and uh, 11 textbooks. This will be the 11th book. So I've certainly got plenty of information to draw, draw from and draw upon. After that, we'll have a core, a section of core competencies and self-assessment. And of course, the book will conclude with uh, coined phrases and an index, uh, which will be even more important if, if indeed this book does go into two volumes. So uh, thank you for letting me introduce this upcoming work. Uh, I think you'll find it a valuable addition to your personal library and one that will certainly help you uh, unravel and untangle these mysteries that we have around chronic inflammatory disease. So again, this has been Dr. Alex Vasquez. Thank you for your attention.